for the moving room, but I think it will be a bit quieter here in the coming hour. And the floor will uh, not bother us so much. So our next speaker of the morning is Tad Jacobson from Maryland. And he will talk about gravitational thermodynamics of the space spacetime and cosmic dynamics. Please, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me know if this is too loud or... Yeah, it sounds like it might be. Okay? That's good. Okay. Um, are... So, in his, uh, after his tremendously important and influential work on gauge theory and uh, quantum field theory and particle physics, Carroll turned his attention to quantum gravity. And if I understand right, from looking at his uh, autobiography, for example, at the Nobel website, um, his motivation was to address the deepest problems, actually, in particle physics, which were, according to him, the naturalness question, the origin of the standard model parameters, and maybe even the ultraviolet divergences of quantum field theory. And uh, in quantum gravity, he looked at many different aspects of the subject, including a discrete model of uh, space time, a lot of work on classical and quantum gravity in two plus one dimensions, including a remarkable derivation of a, a quantization of time in two plus one gravity, which I still haven't fully understood, but I hope to, and a lot of work that we've heard about previously in the meeting on the quantum black hole, and what can be learned from that. And all of that work led me, in 1994, to uh, ask Gerard if he might be willing to, or able to, host me in Utrecht for a sabbatical year. I had started as a professor in 1988, and that was my first sabbatical. And he kindly agreed, and I came here with my wife and very young children, and had a wonderful year for which I'm extremely grat grateful. And since then, uh, I've also been working on many of the things that Herard had worked on and has continued to work on. Herard's motivation, if I understand it, for looking at uh, focusing on the quantum black hole was the conviction that to understand quantum gravity, it's like a touchstone or a key, a key puzzle for quantum gravity is to understand the quantum black hole. And this is, in a certain sense, I guess, clear to all of us, or we, many people agree with that, including myself. But on the other hand, I mean, a black hole we understand from relativity locally near the horizon is just like any other space-time. And so it seems like um, even though it might be easier to, or the best entry point into quantum gravity to tangle with the puzzles of, black, of quantum black holes, the lessons finally learned should just be the same lessons as we would learn from empty space-time. Um, and so that led me to focus more on how can I understand what black holes are leading me to look at, but look at in empty space-time. Because it's, it should be the same physics, at least according to my viewpoint. So, um, well, now ADS-CFT, I would say, is probably our best advanced so far in quantum gravity, getting a handle on quantum gravity, or a quantum gravity, I should say. I don't want to prejudice that it's, it's the only way to quantize gravity, but it seems to be a way. And um, it provides a lot of insight, but it relies very, very heavily. And, one, and the reason why it's provided so much insight is that it has a boundary of the space-time where we can anchor things in a, in a way where geometry is not fluctuating. Um, so, ultimately, we hope to, you know, get detached from that boundary and understand quantum gravity in a more local or quasi-local way. And that kind of thinking has led me to focus on quasi-local black hole thermodynamics ideas, but without the black holes. Now, I can't claim to, unfortunately, have made much progress on the truly quantum part of the problem, although I'll mention very briefly one thing I'm looking at right now in that regard. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the quasi-local thermodynamics of just space-time, or empty space-time, or in particular, in this case, causal diamonds in space-time. And uh, much of what I'll talk about is related to work I've done with Manus Visser, who's here, 
um, and previously did by myself in 2015, and also forthcoming work with Batul Bami Um Let's see, is that all I wanted to say before jumping in? Yeah, so that's, let's just get started. So I want to just start by saying then many thanks to Herard for his courageous, creative, and stimulating contributions to science. And, oh, I don't have to control this thing. And many thanks to the organizers of this meeting for a courageous and stimulating cross-disciplinary conference. So let's just start with a, a key thing, the black philanthropy um, has been discussed much already. Here I'm writing the generalized entropy, which is the horizon contribution that Bekenstein introduced, um, plus this outside entropy of uh, ordinary entropy or quantum entropy of matter fields outside the black hole. Now, more precisely, this, this sum really means that we should regulate this outside entropy somehow. Because, I mean, the entropy of the vacuum outside a sharp surface is infinite in relativistic quantum field theory. So we should understand this as instruction to impose some kind of a cutoff, get a finite outside entropy, and then, you know, this, at that cutoff, that should be a consistent regulator of the theory, which at the same time regulates uh, loop corrections in, in gravity, and therefore we get some gravitational coupling constant g that depends on the scale of the regulator. And then, uh, the sum of those two, the idea is, should be independent of where we place that regulator, so that really, uh, as we change the scale of the cutoff, the, the generalized entropy contribution flows, let's say, between outside entropy and this horizon contribution. So that in the infrared, at some very low energy cutoff, there's almost nothing in the entanglement entropy, and it's all packaged into this horizon entropy. But if we took a really high scale cutoff, we could drive this term to zero, because, well, Newton's constant becomes very big in the ultraviolet, and this term goes to zero, and the whole thing is, is, is just entanglement entropy somehow. Of course, that somehow is a big caveat because that's in the UV of the theory. It's presumably the UV of the quantum gravity theory. So in some UV completed sense, this suggests that the generalized entropy, and in fact what the bekenstein hawking entropy represents, is the entanglement entropy of the vacuum. But it's a question of how to understand that statement in quantum gravity. which I won't address very much in this talk, but I just wanted to start with the fundamental underpinning of the whole subject. I wanted to mention this because it's my best attempt to understand why this entanglement entropy comes out finite, despite the fact that in local quantum field theory we have an infinite number of degrees of freedom at short distance, and, and it should have been an infinite entropy. And so here's a picture of just flat space time with the right and left Rindler wedges, so just dividing space into, into two halves. And then in the vacuum, we have correlated or entangled vacuum fluctuations labeled here, for instance, A and A tilde, and B and B tilde. And these are sort of pairs of fluctuations separated by some scale. We can organize the fluctuations into scales. And um, if we, and the infinity comes from the shortest scale, that is, as the scale of separation goes to zero, when the fluctuations approach each other, on opposite sides of the dividing surface, or if it's a black hole, the horizon. So we can ask the question, uh, what is quantum mechanics, how does quantum mechanics limit this consideration? Well, we have the usual energy distance type uncertainty relation, that the uncertainty in the energy sort of associated with the pair is going to be at least one, the inverse of the spatial separation, the proper separation of the pair. And then if we take into account gravity, and this fluctuating energy is sourcing gravity, and then ask at what scale LC does it happen that the, the Schwarzschild radius associated with that energy uncertainty goes outside of the scale LC. And that scale, of course, turns out to be the Planck scale. And what it means is that if the vacuum fluctuations are, are separated more closely than the Planck scale, 
the geometry, the quantum fluctuations of geometry or order unity, we don't really know what the causal structure is here, and the idea of counting the entanglement between B and B tilde as a contribution to outside entropy ceases to be meaningful because we can't, we can't identify the outside that sharply. So this is my, my attempt to understand why, but it's clear that this answer relies on quantum gravity operating at the Planck scale, which of course we can't handle just with a quantum field theory argument. Okay, so that's the background. Now, uh, jumping into the infrared, we sort of got led to this sort of perspective on the vacuum through the first law of black hole mechanics and Bekenstein's idea that black holes have an entropy. And that started with nothing to do with entanglement, or quantum mechanics even, but a classical observation, actually it did have to do with quantum mechanics. But uh, key to it was this classical relationship, which actually Bekenstein identified in 1972 by varying parameters in the Kerr-Newman family of black hole solutions that uh, mass variation, area, angular momentum, and charge are related here in kappa is the surface gravity of the black hole, omega's angular velocity of the horizon, and phi is the electrostatic potential. Okay, so that was kind of, a, in a way, a superficial uh, uh, argument because he simply varied parameters in a, in a family of stationary solutions. A deeper view of this formula was very quickly obtained by Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking uh, using the Einstein equation directly and a killing vector identity for the stationary black holes that they admit a killing vector. And they derived first this thing called the SMAR formula, which actually SMAR had previously derived in another way, um, relating the, sim the same quantities. And it's just a formula that holds for each stationary solution. And then they considered variations from one of those solutions to another and derived this formula. And then, only 20 years later, the true meaning of this formula finally emerged. And that was through the work of Bob Wald and his collaborators, which is to derive this from, uh, for actually, and to generalize it in, in a couple of profound ways. First of all, beyond general relativity to any diffeomorphism invariant theory and uh, beyond perturbations to stationary solutions, but actually just perturbations to any solution. And that's important if it's gonna truly have a thermodynamic interpretation because you know, the, the first law or the clausius relation of thermodynamics really governs perturbations of an equilibrium state. You don't have to perturb to a nearby equilibrium state for that relation to hold. And in fact, this derivation I'm referring to uh, has those properties. And I'll mention a little bit later of how the derivation works and apply it not just to black holes, but to these causal diamonds. So the, the lesson then is that diffeomorphism invariance lies at the root of this relation that ties together variations of surface integrals at infinity and the horizon. Maybe I should have emphasized that. We just look at the form of this relation uh, the mass and angular momentum and charge can all be expressed by flux integrals at infinity. And the area is like an integral over the horizon in the interior. So this is a relationship between integrals out here and integrals in here. And why are those related to each other? Because of diffeomorphism invariance. So it's the key to the whole, it's the origin or the source of the whole subject. And shouldn't be, its importance shouldn't be underestimated. Okay, so this particular talk, the themes will be the following. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, how locally can these notions of black hole thermodynamics be applied? A particular example of that will be the de Sitter static patch. Yes? What if there are gravity waves between infinity and the black hole? What if there are gravity waves between infinity and the black hole? Yeah, then the formula's not really true, right? Well, it's a first order variation away from stationary. And the gravity waves, I don't think, will make a contribution at first order. Um, yeah, so the de Sitter space has been a kind of mesmerizing and confusing uh, thing for ever since it was originally introduced for one reason or another. 
And uh, I want to focus on that as an example of a causal diamond, but also more general ones. And I'll talk about the SMART formula of first law, and actually a surprising claim. And I'm really glad that Andy is here because I think he'll disagree strongly. We'll have a great discussion about it that the causal diamond actually, or the consider static patch, has negative temperature, not positive temperature, has been, as has been thought for, for most of um, history. And also the question of can we define thermodynamic ensembles for consider space in a cogent way. And I'll present some work that I've been doing very recently that's not complete yet on understanding that. And finally, there's this connection to the Einstein equation. All this, of course, relies on the Einstein equation because we're, you know, this uh, deriving the first law comes out of the Einstein equation, but conversely, a small causal diamond in any space-time could be viewed as a small deformation of a flat or maximally symmetric causal diamond, and it therefore will have to satisfy this first law that I'm going to show you for causal diamonds that's analogous to the first law of black hole mechanics. And in fact, the classical Einstein equation is equivalent to the first law holding for all those diamonds. So it's like an equilibrium thermodynamics formulation of what the Einstein equation says. Um, where the equilibrium is, con is concerned with the, the system defined inside small causal diamonds. And uh, this is probably, I would say, but it's not definitively shown happening because entanglement entropy is maximized in such diamonds in the vacuum state. And in any state is near the vacuum at short distances. So that's, those are key thematic uh, statements. And what I won't have time to talk about, but I just wanted to mention because I think various people in the audience will know about this and might have useful things to tell me about it, and you might just find it interesting. So in an attempt to take this to a different level, eventually I want to consider quantizing a causal diamond. And that turns out to be, of course, difficult, but in two plus one dimensions, as Gerard was the first to show us, gravity is much simpler and a useful uh, proving ground for quantum gravity concepts. So with Rodrigo Silva, I've been working on trying to understand what it means to quantize a two plus one dimensional causal diamond in the case of a negative cosmological constant. And so far, what we've got is that the reduced phase space so this is uh, with a fixed uh, metric on the boundary. So in the case of two plus one, that means just a fixed circumference of the boundary. The reduced phase space is the cotangent bundle of diff S1, the diffeomorphisms of the circle, modulo PSL2R, and, uh, and we're working on understanding what it means to quantize this system. But that's all I'll say about that. Okay, so now to kick into more of the main story, uh, here's the classic paper by Gibbons and Hawking from 1977, where they observed a lot of things about black hole thermodynamics extend to the case of De Sitter space, including the first a first law, including a second law, including uh, thermal excitation of a, of a thermometer, analogous to the Unruh effect, and so forth. And it's all based on, of course, the de Sitter solution to Einstein's equation. Being in the Netherlands, I thought I should give some homage to de Sitter. So we're going to take a look at him for a second here. Uh, this, unfortunately, this picture is taken like 20 years at least after he came up with this simple solution to Einstein's equation. Here it's written in the static, so-called static patch, which is displayed on this two-dimensional diagram as the blue region, but so doesn't cover the whole hyperboloid. It's got a length scale L, and otherwise it's just, it turns out, it's a maximally symmetric space. It's like a hypersphere in a one higher dimensional uh, Minkowski space. So in an attempt to find a picture of him when he was the age where he actually found this solution, I, I overshot. I found this picture of him 20 years younger than that, which is when he was uh, in his 20s. He, was, he actually is an astronomer, really. You know, he was observing the satellites of Jupiter and uh, 
looks great in that picture. And then we've got one more interesting picture where he's been used, it looks like, by in a discussion with Einstein, presumably over the cosmological implications of the sitter space. Um, anyway. So here's a picture of the De Sitter horizon of, of a static pack. So a particular observer, pick anyone, it's a maximally symmetric space, so it doesn't matter which. An inertial observer is surrounded by this De Sitter horizon. Here's a picture of it on a spatial slice. And uh, looking at it, um, you see, according to Gibbons and Hawking, that it has a temperature uh, which is like the Hawking temperature of a black hole horizon, h bar times the surface gravity over 2 pi. In this case, the surface gravity is the inverse of that length scale L that I mentioned in the metric. And uh, also, this horizon has an area and associated entropy, given also by the Van Steen Hawking formula. And moreover, when this, dis when this patch is perturbed, it satisfies the first law or the quasi explanation and a generalized second law. So here's a great picture from their paper, Gibbons and Hawking's paper, of Penrose diagram of the short chill de Sitter solution. They also have the uh, curved de Sitter solution, uh, but I wanted to, this one's a little easier to figure out what's going on. So, uh, well, it's an infinite chain. You could identify left and right at some point, but that's not relevant to what we're saying. We're really focusing actually on this um, red diamond shaped region, which is bounded on one side by the cosmological horizon. So here there's a R equals infinity, future null infinity, like De Sitter infinity. And then on the other side, there's a black hole horizon with a Schwarzschild type singularity and the same thing in the past. And so this defines actually a static patch of a Schwarzschild de Sitter space-time. So I'll consider later the case where there's no black hole, but for the moment, let's just look at this more general case. Uh, one thing that Gibbons and Hawking derived is this first law of event horizons, which they got by, again, deriving a SMART formula and then varying it in a kind of complicated way. Actually, they didn't show the complications, but if you want to see the complications, look in the Bardeen, Carter, Hawking paper. It's really awkward, by the way, the way it's done. And Wald's, you know, Wald's uh, insight was not only to this tremendous generalization of it, but it was also a tremendous simplification of, of how to derive the result. Okay, so they, they derived the first law of what they call the first law of event horizons which relates uh, these quantities. So this is the area of the cosmological horizon, the area of the black hole horizon. They each have a surface gravity. This was actually for the case of spinning black holes. So there's also a angular momentum variation and angular velocity. And on the left, it, delta T is, the, is a matter stress tensor variation. K is the static killing field, and actually stationary in this case. Um, and we're integrating basically a component of that, like the killing energy density over a spatial slice. The surface runs between this horizon and that horizon. Okay, so that's the first law of event horizons according to Gibbons and Hawking. Now let's, for the moment, throw away the black hole and just consider the sitter space by itself. Then we just drop all the terms except for these two. And that looks satisfactory, but it does have a peculiar feature, which is this minus sign. Because what it's saying is that if we add positive killing energy, so here's now the static patch of the sitter space. This, this would be a geodesic of just some observer in the sitter space surrounded by the horizon. Um, suppose we add positive killing energy to this patch. Then the entropy goes down because this cap is defined in a positive way. There's a minus sign there. So adding energy decreases entropy. That sounds like a negative temperature. Now, Gibbons and Hawking were certainly aware of that, and they said, actually, uh, that's not the right way to look at it because you could, because of uh, the sitter space 
complete spatial section is closed. There's a, the total killing energy on a complete spatial hypersurface is zero if we perturb away from the sitter. And so this particular killing energy inside here uh, is the negative of the killing energy on the other side. And they said, let's re-express it as the negative of the killing energy on the other side. And then that minus sign will cancel this minus sign. And the relation will tell us that uh, the, a positive addition to killing energy on the outside increases the entropy. And therefore, we can interpret this as positive temperature. I think that's what they were saying. Um, I think that's actually a flawed reasoning for a simple reason which is that the killing vector, as was mentioned earlier in the meeting, if it's going future on pointing on this side of this horizon, then it's a past pointing killing vector on the other side of the horizon. So if the killing energy on the right side is the negative of the killing energy on the left, then sort of the, but that's killing energy reckoned with respect to a past pointing killing vector. So it's actually a positive killing, it's a positive, proper energy density still, and yet it's still being related to a negative change of entropy. So I don't think it's correct that uh, the interpretation or the device they're invoking to it somehow escape this minus sign. Also I should say, their reasoning was interpreting the entropy as the entropy of the outside rather than the inside, which also doesn't make sense to me. Is a comment or question? I think your protection would also say that for black holes it would not work. Because there the killing energy on the other side is also the other direction. Yeah, but I don't make any but I don't change the sign. I just use the energy outside and have a relation like this with a plus sign for black holes. Wouldn't we get the same relation for black holes if we set the ADM mass variation to be zero? So if we consider variations where the ADM mass variation is zero, and we change the energy outside the black hole, then we'll have to decrease the horizon area. What I'm saying is maybe, that this maybe. formula is not, I mean, we would get exactly the same formula if we were doing a variation of the outside of a black hole yeah, maybe. in the ADM mass. Uh, you might. Yeah. It sounds like you probably would, but I haven't looked at it. Yeah. If you just had a thermometer, Yes, that's exactly what I wanted to get to next. <laughs> Thank you. So isn't the given talking temperature actually positive? Yes, indeed. The de Sitter vacuum, technically what's happening is that the de Sitter vacuum in the static patch is thermal with respect to the Hamiltonian that generates that static time translation symmetry. That's like the Unruh effect. So, as Andy was implying, doesn't this contradict some idea that we should associate a negative temperature? And I claim no, it doesn't, for the following reason. The, um, the matter entropy, it actually adds to the de Sitter Frozen entropy and forms the generalized entropy. Take a look at the equation again that we had. Now let me use what people call today the first law of entanglement entropy. If I make a variation of the quantum, so imagine this is coming from quantum variation of the state. Then uh, this killing energy variation is equal to the Gibbons Hawking temperature times the entanglement entropy variation inside the diamond. And it's, the equation is telling me that's equal to the negative of the Gibbons Hawking temperature times the, black, times the horizon entropy variation. So if I put this on the other side of the equation, it's telling me that the generalized entropy is stationary. And in fact, as I emphasized at the beginning, we really shouldn't be considering entanglement entropy separately. It should always go together with the horizon contribution because it's the sum of those that's invariant under the, the regularization procedure for defining the matter entanglement entropy. So I think it's quite satisfactory, actually, that this is negative and it's interpreted as negative temperature because it allows us to combine those two. And then this, this, this law becomes the statement that the generalized entropy is stationary, which suggests that maybe it's stationary because it's maximum and that the entropy in the Sitter space in the De Sitter static patch is the maximum entropy state. 
which is kind of natural if a maximally symmetric space-time represents an equilibrium state, or the most equilibrium you could have. So here's some supporting arguments for that viewpoint. Um, so the, if you look at the sum of the cosmological and black hole horizon areas, that would be the total horizon entropy, so forgetting matter for the moment. But you consider um, very varying the black hole mass, um, then for fixed cosmological constant, this sum, the total entropy, is maximized when there's no black hole, when you just have empty de Sitter. It's also maximized in other ways. For example, suppose we don't fix lambda, but we fix the volume between the two horizons, the proper volume. You can check that this is maximized when there's no black hole. You can also check it at fixed energy, where by energy here I mean the total another charge associated with this static killing vector. Uh, that charge depends on the normalization of the killing vector, so I have to fix that too somehow. And I fixed it so the surface gravity of the cosmological horizon is one. Um, and, and if we consider instead of a black hole with consider replacing the black hole by matter, well, the black hole for a given energy will have less entropy than, I mean, will have more entropy than the matter, so if we couldn't have decreased the entropy by putting a black hole in, we're not going to be able to decrease it, sorry, increase it, we won't be able to increase it by putting matter in, that's what I'm trying to say. So again, uh, it's consistent with the hypothesis that the entropy is maximized in the empty de Sitter static patch. And uh, we also have this dynamical argument due to Busso that generalized second law, when you consider dynamical processes in a space-time that's asymptotically de Sitter space in the future, that, um, that, um, that the entropy of the, of the static patch, the dynamical static patch, can be no larger than the entropy of the empty de Sitter horizon. This idea is also related to something I'll mention more later, which is something I formulated in 2015, this hypothesis that actually in the vacuum, <coughs> entanglement entropy is maximized. You could almost say that defines the vacuum state, but it should be maximized at fixed something, and in the case I was discussing, it was at fixed volume. And, uh, with, and it's maximized with respect to what? Well, with respect to variations of the the geometry and the quantum state of, of quantum fields away from a suitable maximally symmetric state. Okay. <clears throat> well, that was specific to the Sitter static patch, but now let's generalize that to any causal diamond in a maximally symmetric space. But to do that, I want to just quickly review uh, briefly what Wald's method is for extracting, you know, uh, consequences of diffeomorphism invariance for these surface integrals. So this is just a beautiful enough thing I should just sketch really quickly in case you have a sense of what's behind this derivation. It's really quite beautiful. So there's a Lagrangian deform, let's say, in d space time dimensions that defines the, the field theory. And its variation Phi just represents all the fields. Its variation is equations of motion times the field variation. And you might need to integrate by parts when you vary the Lagrangian. So in other words, there could be a an exact form d theta, such that the action, this won't contribute except at the boundary to the, to the action. <clears throat> so this theta, rather than being an afterthought, is a really important thing. It defines the symplectic structure of the theory. <coughs> Um, and it's called a symplectic potential form. And using it, you can construct another current, which is a d minus one form, by evaluating it with the variation being equal to the lead derivative of the fields along some killing vector, uh, sorry, along some vector field. So for any vector field chi, there's an associated another current. And then you subtract the contraction of that vector field with the Lagrangian form. So in the special case of like, you know, zero plus one dimensions, this would be like PQ dot minus the Lagrangian, and so this would be the Hamiltonian. This is a, a field theory generalization of the Hamiltonian of a, of a system. 
Now, the key thing is that when the Lagrangian is diffeomorphism covariant and the equation of motion holds, this current, J chi, is exact. It's equal to the exterior derivative of some d minus 2 form called another charge form. And then just integrating this equation across it, over any region will tell you that the boundary integral of Q is equal to the bulk integral of J. And that is the SMAR formula. All the SMAR formulas come just from this relation. And the special case of the original SMAR formula, chi was actually a killing field. And so uh, the Lie derivative of the fields with respect to chi would be zero for a killing field. So this term would be zero. And for general relativity, in vacuum, the Ricci scalar vanishes, so the Lagrangian term vanishes, so J itself vanishes, so the right-hand side is zero, and the SMART formula is just a relation between surface integrals. But in a more general setting, you would have non-zero contributions from J. Um, for example, like in De Sitter space, even though in a static patch you do have a killing vector, so the first term vanishes, um, the Lagrangian is r minus 2 lambda, which doesn't vanish in vacuum, so you actually get a bulk of contribution proportional to the cosmological constant. Now the first law comes from varying this formula, varying the, yeah, I should say before I switch it, just making a variation of this formula. So on this side, since I said J is like the Hamiltonian, you'll get something like the variation of the Hamiltonian. And here you'll get the derivative of the variation of the another charge. And working that out, if you assume the variation is away from a, a background satisfying the equation of motion, and that the variation satisfies the first order, you know, linearized equation of motion, and actually you only need the, the linearized um, initial value constraint. So only, it only involves the pullback of these forms to the spatial surface, so it only involves the initial value constraints, which really means that you're considering any variation in the phase space, because if, if, if you're in the phase space, you have to satisfy the initial value constraint. So it's not a dynamical equation, it's just a variation in phase space. Uh, you get that the variation of the Hamiltonian is equal to this surface integral. And if chi is a true killing vector um, of the background and matter fields, then the Hamiltonian doesn't vary. And so then you just get this relation between surface integrals, and that's the, how the first law arises. Um, if you had classical matter or a cosmological constant variation, you actually get a volume contribution because although the metric might be stationary, to formulate the field theory of classical matter or cosmological constant, you have to introduce potentials that are not invariant under the symmetry, even though the stress-energy tensor they give rise to is. And so for that reason, you actually get a non-zero contribution. <coughs> I don't want to dwell on technicalities here. But just write down now the answer that comes out for the case of any maximally symmetric causal diamond, of which the De Sitter static patch is a special case. So I just mean take a De Sitter, anti De Sitter, or flat space, pick uh, two points, take the future of one and the past of the other, where they intersect, they form this causal diamond. It possesses a conformal killing vector. In the case of the De Sitter static patch, the time uh, elapsed between the lower vertex and the upper goes to infinity, and, and the, the, it actually admits a true killing vector. But for a general finite size causal diamond, um, it doesn't. But it still admits a conformal killing vector, which it turns out is good enough to get something essentially like the first law. You know, the, the concept of surface gravity extends to a conformal killing vector, and there's just one additional term that arises, as I'll point to here. So this is what uh, was in the work that Mattis and I did. So we get this formula that the matter conformal killing energy variation is um, minus kappa times the 
area variation of the boundary of the diamond. There's an additional term which is the variation of the volume of the diamond times the extrinsic curvature of the edge of the diamond in the space time. And then there's a term if we want to allow the cosmological constant to vary, which I do for later purposes, multiplied by something called the thermodynamic volume, which is just the volume form contracted with this uh, conformal killing vector, just integrated over a spatial slice. So it's like a redshifted volume. For the case of the Sitter static patch, um, the extrinsic curvature of the horizon is zero. And of course, also, you have a killing vector. So this term shouldn't be there. And in fact, it's not, because k is zero. In general, it is there. And actually, uh, Manus and I realized one way, you could even, without calculating anything where this came from, infer that this must be there by a slick argument using diffeomorphism invariance. Uh, if you consider a variation that is just a pure diffeo, then this doesn't change, and the cosmological constant isn't varied. So this, whatever is here, shouldn't change either. But the area would change. But it's possible to show that in a pure diffeo variation, this combination does not change. So it's, it's sort of, you can infer it must be the combination you have there. One other comment about this, the general one, is that uh, the fact that the volume appears here is related to the York, the fact that York time Hamiltonian is the volume in general relativity. York time is the time function that is given by the trace or minus the trace of the extrinsic curvature of a constant mean curvature foliation. And it turns out that this conformal killing vector defines a foliation that also has constant mean curvature on every slice. And on this particular slice through the middle, it's actually a true killing vector. And the first order variation of killing time away from it is the same as up to a constant as the first order variation of York time. So the Hamiltonian term we get should presumably be related to what York found, which is that the Hamiltonian is the volume. That's just kind of an interesting side observation. So my comments on this would be, first of all, this, this diamond, like the Desir static patch, has negative temperature. And that any small diamond, as I mentioned earlier, in an arbitrary spacetime can be viewed as one of these things. Instead of starting in an exactly maximally symmetric space and varying it slightly, you could start in any spacetime, take a small enough diamond, and view it as the result of having varied a maximally symmetric diamond. And it would have to satisfy that formula that I just derived, that I just showed, because that just follows from the Einstein equation. And if the full space time satisfies the Einstein equation, that must be satisfied. But conversely, if that is satisfied for all diamonds at each point and at each orientation, that's enough information to extract the Einstein equation. So that relation I just showed you is, is equivalent in that sense to the to the Einstein equation. Let's see, I should keep track of how much time do I have left? 10 minutes. Okay, I think that's good. Um, so I just want to mention the issue again now of how to, of the connection to entanglement entropy interpretation of this first law. In particular, the idea that the entanglement entropy is maximized in the vacuum or Maybe maximize the value. <coughs> so suppose, first of all, that we just have conformal quantum field as matter. And we have one of these maximally symmetric diamonds. Then the matter term in the first law, just as I mentioned earlier, we could re-express it in terms of the matter entanglement entropy variation using the first law of entanglement, which is really just using the fact that the vacuum state looks like a thermal state with respect to this Hamiltonian in a causal diamond. And that's true for conformal matter, even if you just have a conformal filling field. So then you wouldn't have any other term, you would just have this. And uh, just as I mentioned earlier, you could trade this term for an entropy term, add that to the area entropy, and re-express this first law as the statement that 
at fixed volume and fixed cosmological constant, the entanglement entropy is stationary. But that's only if the matter is conformal. What if it's not conformal? So here, um, then it's no longer true that, um, that we can't invoke this thermal equilibrium property of the vacuum that identifies the Hamiltonian expectation value um, variation with the entropy variation. But, and I have to admit this, working backwards, I conjectured that maybe it's almost equal to that, and there's a, there's a correction term that is a scalar variation um, in times something. In fact, that something is exactly that thermodynamic volume. And this relation has actually been checked independently by Speranza and also Cassini, Galante, and Myers, that it holds, and that and in particular, they show that this x this x quantity, is um, while it well they both showed well it depends on the size of the ball, which I think is okay, or the diamond. It's invariant under boosts of the diamond that fix the center, and that's crucial to the statement I'm, statement I'm about to make because I want to be able to uh, apply this relation to all diamonds, including the boosted ones, to extract the tensor equation of motion. Okay, so uh, if you assume this is true and you take as support the calculations done by these people, then you can once again combine the matter energy variation with the horizon entropy variation and matter, turning it into the generalized entropy variation. But you have a leftover term, which is the thermodynamic volume times this x variation. But remember in the first law, that we derived in general, allowing for a cosmological constant variation. We had a term that looked exactly like that, right here, where delta lambda was just the cosmological constant variation we might have elected to include. So calling that term now um, the little lambda and adding it to the x contribution, we have some sort of overall effective cosmological constant variation. And if we hold that, if we set that to zero, in other words, we, we cancel any external cosmological constant variation by, by this x1 or vice versa, and if we hold the volume fixed, then the, the first law I was just showing you has the interpretation of stating that the generalized entropy is stationary. So that's, that's the condition of entanglement equilibrium. I've got some arguments to the effect that it's not only stationary, but it's maximum. But to really formulate that sharply beyond um, the semi-classical approximation, I don't know how to do it. I think that's what I just said. Well, I'll ask you. So let me end by just the last item, which is really quite different from what I've been talking about, which is uh, can we uh, associate ensembles, really thermodynamic ensembles, with the Schwarzschild de Sitter case. We started thinking about this because we wanted to substantiate this negative temperature idea by defining a well-defined thermodynamic ensemble like as a path integral and deriving completely independently the sign of the temperature. And we have sort of mixed results. The first thing, of course, to do is look at Gibbons and Hawking, and they did have a partition function for de Sitter space but I have to say it makes no sense to me because uh, where is the reservoir? So what's understood and what Gibbons and Hawking did for black hole thermodynamics is to consider a reservoir at infinity where the temperature is fixed and then just look at the gravitating system with that boundary and that temperature and do the path integral expressing the partition function with those boundary conditions and find a saddle point, and basically they extracted all the black hole thermodynamics in that formal but compelling way from quantum gravity partition function. But they attempted to do it also for de Sitter in a way that made no sense to me. Yeah. Shouldn't we think of it as a microcanonical ensemble where we can vary the temperature? And, uh, you could also, well, you could try that. We're going to do both. Okay. Uh, but either way, I think you need to have a boundary where you define either the temperature or the energy. And Gibbons and Hawking just took the whole de Sitter. They did some Euclidean thing that made no sense to me. So I wanted to make sense of it, and the only way I knew how is by something introduced by 
Jim York and Bernard Whiting in 1986, which was to just introduce a boundary, even for the case of black hole thermodynamics. It was a lot like what the Hawking page construction, which was three years earlier in Anthony Sears space, achieved. Their real, one of their goals was to stabilize the canonical ensemble, because for a black hole in flat space, the canonical ensemble is unstable. That corresponds to instability of the black hole. But if you put a boundary there and fix the temperature on the boundary, that can stabilize the ensemble. Because the temperature you're fixing is it's the local temperature at the boundary, and the redshift factor plays a crucial role in stabilizing the ensemble for large black holes. So we wanted to adopt that uh, construction and apply it to De Sitter space. Um, in this case, the temperature is fixed, like I just said, by at the boundary by the Euclidean, well, I didn't say Euclidean, but it's by the uh, Euclidean time period, and the path integral is over Euclidean uh, metrics with that time period at the boundary, and that determines the partition function and thus an entropy, as usual in, st in staff metrics. Alternatively, later Brown and York defined the microcanonical ensemble where they fix not the full boundary metric, but just the spatial metric on the boundary and the energy momentum density on the boundary defined by the boundary stress tensor, which also Brown and York had introduced. Then they defined a path integral that gives not the partition function, but the density of states at that energy and momentum, or angular momentum. And once you have the uh, density of states, you have the entropy, you also have the energy, because that defines the ensemble, so you can extract the entropy and temperature that way. And so the question basically what was motivating us is, are these ensembles consistent with assigning negative temperatures to the center space? Before I tell you the answer, I should say that it's really a different question than I started with. I started with a diamond, uh, whereas now I've introduced a boundary and defined boundary conditions on that boundary, and so it's, it's a somewhat different ensemble. But we still sort of expected slash hoped that we would still get this negative temperature out. So here's a picture of, so we're gonna just restrict to Schwarzschild to Sitter, so we have a one parameter family of potential you know, classical saddle point solutions, and we're going to look at stationary points with respect to varying the black hole mass. Uh, Schwarzschild de Sitter, we have a black hole in the middle, cosmological horizon outside, and the system boundary somewhere in between. And if we look towards the inside, then we're talking about the black hole system. If we look to the outside, we're talking about the cosmological system. So there are two systems to be considered. If the black hole gets really big, you can see that now it's close to the boundary, and so this is a very high temperature there because like, the boundary is highly accelerated, uh, so we have that high unroot temperature there. And that's why um, this stabilizes the ensemble, because when the black hole gets bigger, instead of getting colder, and therefore absorbing more radiation from the bath, and getting even bigger, it's, uh, it's getting hotter, because the temperature is fixed uh, at, this, at this boundary. So we're fixing, yeah, it can't, if it got even bigger, the redshifted temperature at the location of the boundary would be higher, even though the black hole is bigger. So that's the stabilizing mechanism. Okay, so what are the results? And then I'll end. These are preliminary, very preliminary. I only tell them because I think it's intriguing to give these results, but as you'll see, we're kind of still confused by a couple of things. So first, let's consider the canonical ensemble, then the micro canonical. Uh, I just described already what you do for that. So consider, we get to put in the temperature. So if we put a positive temperature in, then the integrand of the path integral is e to the minus i times the Euclidean action. And for the black hole system, the stationary point of the Euclidean action with respect to variations of the black hole mass exists if the temperature is high enough and it's a local minimum. And it's actually a global minimum if the temperature is even higher enough. And we want it to be a minimum because otherwise it wouldn't be dominating the path integral over e to the minus i action. 
So it's important to check that it's a minimum, not a maximum. And the entropy thermodynamically evaluates to AO report. This is basically the result that Whiting and York got for black holes, but applied to Schwarzschild de Sitter. <coughs> for the cosmological system, um, again, the stationary point of the action exists if the temperature is high enough, but it's a global maximum. So it's a place where the integrand is minimum. And therefore, it's a lousy approximation to the path integral and is totally not to be trusted. And there's no, I would say, the interpretation is there is no semi classical positive temperature ensemble. And that uh, supports our claim that the temperature is really negative. However, if we then try it with a negative temperature, we seem to derive that the integrand of the path integral should be the exponential of plus the Euclidean action, the same Euclidean action. Now for the black hole system and the, and the cosmological system, we hit a contradiction that means we've made an error somewhere. Because a maximum action solution exists, it's a plus I action, so that maximum action solution should dominate the path integral. But then if you take that partition function and compute the entropy from it, we get a negative entropy, okay, which is clearly absurd. It means that we haven't correctly approximated this partition function. So we must have made a sign error somewhere. The simple, the simple uh, resolution would be that this should have been a minus sign, not a plus sign. But so far, it really seems to us it's a plus sign. So we don't understand that. And then finally, for the microcanonical ensemble, um, it's quite a different path integral. Now, we, it's a path integral for the density of states, not for the partition function. This is what was introduced by Brown and York. It's a sum over periodic metrics, but the period is not fixed. And the integrand is e to the i times the Lorentzian action. But there is no smooth stationary point with a horizon. So, <coughs> Brown and York argued that you should deform the contour into complex metrics and find a complex or, or imaginary or Euclidean saddle point. And uh, they did that for the case of a black hole and got the sensible result that the entropy is, is the area over four. So we tried that in the present case and we reproduced that for the black hole system. For the cosmological system, uh, we also got the correct entropy, horizon area over four. But we found that unlike the diamond argument, the temperature defined as the variation of entropy with respect to energy uh, inverse is, pos is positive. So it seems like the microcanonical ensemble exists. It has a semi-classical limit. It has the right entropy that we expect. And it, has, and it corresponds to a positive temperature. So um, that seems not to strictly contradict what I said about the diamond, because it's defining the ensemble in a different way. But I'm not sure what to think about it. And I'll conclude with this then. Uh, just a couple of statements to restate the, the points. The causal diamonds in maximally symmetric spaces, they appear to be gravitational negative temperature equilibrium systems. And the De Sitter static patch is a special case of that. The Einstein equation corresponds to the first law for all such small diamonds in any space-time. And it's related and possibly equivalent to stationarity and possibly maximality of vacuum entanglement entropy. <coughs> and finally, the York et al. method of defining quasi-local thermodynamic ensembles can be applied to Schwarzschild de Sitter. And the microcanonical ensemble defined this way it doesn't appear to have negative temperature. Canonical ensemble at negative temperature seems to have a semi classical limit but yields negative entropy, so we must have made a mistake. Um, and that's it. Thank you.
But if, if we take the standard example of an icing, climate icing model that goes to negative temperature, I'm sure you can put a thermometer, couple to a thermometer, the thermometer is not going to show negative. So I just didn't understand. I mean, maybe you understood the comment. I didn't understand the comment. Uh, are you worried that, yeah, actually, this gives me the opportunity to emphasize systems in nature with negative temperature do exist. They have to have a Hamiltonian that's bounded above. Yeah. If you couple them to a system that doesn't have such a Hamiltonian, there's going to be some instability in the coupling. If you put a regular thermometer in a spin system, you know, that would right. destroy the equilibrium. And I don't think that was the point. But you wouldn't expect the thermometer to freeze. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, but I think the point temperature is higher. The, negative temperature is higher than... Uh, it's higher than all positive yeah. temperatures. Yeah. But Andy's point was that just the, really, it's, it's the statement that the, the vacuum state in the Desitter static patch, the Desitter vacuum, is a thermal state at positive temperature with respect to the Hamiltonian that generates that Desitter symmetry. You know, for quantum fields in the background. But I'm doing gravitational thermodynamics. So the system includes the gravitational degree of freedom, and the interpretation I'm saying is that um, once we include the matter entropy with the horizon entropy and formulate this thermodynamics in terms of that generalized entropy, the full temperature of this system is negative. I'm still, I still believe that, I, but I'm actually expecting that various people will try to and may succeed in convincing me otherwise well, after I, this talk. Yeah, just to make sure I'm understanding. So you, you had a conjecture, which is the vacuum entanglement entropy is an accident. Right. Now, the relation of entanglement entropy to thermodynamic entropy and so on is not obvious to me, but just following that out, this would have been, then you sort of expected temperatures away from the vacuum to be negative. I mean, it would be, it would be, it would, it would be like a, an icing model where the, the, maximal, the maximal entropy stays in the middle. So then I wouldn't be surprised if the temperatures were coming. Oh wow, that's a nice uh, new point on it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, uh, it has to do with the, the previous questions. Uh, first, so the, the physical meaning of temperature uh, or negative temperature is not at all intuitive. It's just uh, some equation and then it is result, no? And not something intuitively. I mean, a zero well, temperature intuitively means that everything is, is, stops uh, fluctuating, no? It is zero temperature. So minimum uh, negative temperature? Well, like, like it was just said, the negative temperature, temperature is actually hotter than any positive temperature. It's harder. Hotter. Hotter. Ah, hotter. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. So this has nothing to do with the yeah. no? And then the maximum entanglement entropy in the vacuum is something that you conjecture or you obtain it as a yeah, result. question. So I would say I obtained an argument that it's stationary in vacuum. At least, you know, so for conformal fields it's stationary for non-conformal ones modulo this correction of the relation between energy and entropy variation, it's stationary. And I do have some arguments, which I didn't go over, that it's not only stationary, but that it's maximum. But um, when you go beyond first order variations, you should start taking into account second order effects in the gravitational contribution, which I don't know how to do actually properly. And, and ultimately, in the quantum gravity theory, I certainly don't know how to handle this calculation. So I have some sort of partial arguments that it seems to be not only stationary, but maximal. We also have the Desitter case uh, that the classical entropy is truly maximal with respect to some finite variations that I described, like changing the black hole mass. Okay, well, and the last thing, you get uh, negative temperatures, why do you care so much about negative entropy? Well, because it doesn't make any sense according to the definition of entropy. I think I'm computing minus trace of rho log rho for a density matrix rho with 
non-negative eigenvalues bounded by one, so it's just by definition the entropy shouldn't be negative. The thing I think I'm computing, that expression is then like exchanged for a path integral formula, and then for the for the partition function from which the entropy is extracted in the standard way. So if, if we were doing standard quantum statistical mechanics, I would have to get a positive entropy. I couldn't get a negative one, unless I made a mistake computing. Thank you. Here. Just very briefly, I mean, if the entropy is negative, it shouldn't be such a problem because entropy is only fine apart from the constant. So you can always add a large constant, and that might actually imply some interesting physics. That the, the system must be limited to the case where the entropy with that constant added stays constant, stays positive. Yes. So well, I mean, where did you get the overall constant for entropy? I don't think you get it from anywhere. When you define the von Neumann entropy, that thermodynamic ambiguity of the zero of entropy is not <coughs> So minus trace of rho log rho has an absolute. No, no. Okay, in trace of rho log rho, not, but, but in the derivation of the entropy of the Okay, that's a good point. We should see whether in the process of expressing minus trace for rho, rho log rho as a partition function and then approximating that semi classically, have we somehow floated the zero of entropy in a way that we didn't control or <coughs> that we should it, 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 have it. physical meaning even? Yeah, that's a good suggestion. I haven't thought about it. See if we can reach Andy. Okay. <laughs> I, I think there's a, a simple example of, of just that. So um, just in one plus one dimensions, if you want to compute the entanglement entropy, it has a UV uh, divergence. And if you look, say, at the, a situation where you compute the entanglement entropy uh, divided at a point on scrying, and then you have a mirror in the middle of the space which uh, accelerates for a while uh, towards scrying and then stops. Uh, the late time modes will be reflected from scry minus to scry plus will be um, the ones that would have been included at the early stage uh, are not included at the later stage because they've got blue shaded. And therefore, if you define, if you set your cutoff so that this is what Gerard is saying, that there's an arbitrary constant, and of course there's, re there's renormalization of it. So if you set your cutoff so that it's zero initially, you would find it late times that you're entangled back here with negatives. Is, is that discussed in a paper you could mention? Um, I don't know. Yep. A lot of papers on what we learned. I'm not sure they've ever quite said it that way. Okay. I think it's time for lunch. We thank the... Uh,